Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my co-host, Steve Montgomery, the author of Converging Apostasy, a collection of thematic critiques. And together, we're examining the themes of apostasy in the New Apostolic Reformation and their history. Steve, it's been a while since we've gotten to do this, and um, <clears throat> I'll warn the audience right now, I'm, uh, <laughs> I've got a little bit of a head cold, so my voice isn't where it usually is, but we've wanted to do this for a while, and I know that you had some things happening in your family that um, we had to put this on hold for a bit, but I'm very glad we're getting back into it because we have so many people that heard the last episode that have reached out. They're excited to hear more. In fact, I just got a comment today. A lady was asking, when are we going to do more of these? So it's good to have you back. That's great feedback, John. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, you're right. There's uh, there's plenty much coming down the pike as far as this kind of information goes. Uh, I wanted to, to let your, your listeners know that just because of the way they, they do things at Amazon.com with the book publishing, uh, I shortened the uh, the title uh, of the book, and now it's just the more simple version, Converging Apostasy. And that's available on uh, paperback and ebook. And uh, let, the, let the readers beware, or the p- potential readers. That one uh, kind of operates or functions as pretty much a handbook, and it goes like uh, maybe you, you guys, your listeners have heard before, it goes from the uh, uh, the uh, Gnostic um, Valentinus on through the present day uh, uh, issues that are happening with the NAR. Uh, so it's around 470 pages, I'd say. It's got a lot of uh, more information uh, than the the new book, which I have. The new book is around 60 pages, and it does something that I mentioned in the introduction, which is essentially uh, unforgivable for scholars, and that is it doesn't really give a lot of uh, documentation. It pretty stick. It pretty much sticks to the, the facts, uh, quotations, and it runs through what I call a hands-on um, eschatology, meaning um, people feeling like uh, they, they have a doctrinal uh, foundation to to essentially think that they have control over everything in the end times. And so the title of that one is A Quick Outline of Hands-On Eschatology, A Matter of Timing and Agency. And so, again, that's available at uh, Amazon.com, paperback, or ebook. And so what I mean by hands-on eschatology is, again, uh, the idea that perfection dominion, rulership, and a literal sacred purge are all to occur before Christ comes back as an individual. And for most of these folks, including Jane Lead, uh, they think that for these things to to occur, uh, actually the return of the individual Christ is contingent upon all these things being carried out. So, like I said, that one's available uh, now. And uh, I, I write in the introduction, it's pretty helpful if somebody is already aware of uh, scriptural uh, references to the glorification of the body, uh, resurrection, uh, glorification of the saints, and then anything that has to do with Christ's rule, and then anything about what, what we would call the, the judgment day. If they know those, then I really don't have to provide them. Uh, but, you know, there could be even a, a further book about that. Some more interesting information since the last time that you and I spoke. <clears throat> we had mentioned that Charles Price, who was deeply connected to Pentecostalism <clears throat> and the um, Angelus Temple, he had in his possession some of the writings of Jane Lead, and Charles had been digging into this for something that he's working on. And he found that this is the prophecy that talks about the manifested sons of God. There's a statement, and I'm reading it here. It says, there must be a manifestation of the Spirit, whereby to edify and raise up the church. 
bringing heaven down upon earth and representing here the new Jerusalem state, which <clears throat> if you think about where this went from there, that is significant. But even more significant is the timeline. We have, um, <clears throat> you know, William Branham's um, ministry, his later versions of his stage persona claim to have started in 1947, which would be approximately when the latter reign was birthed. However, we have identified documents that pre-exist this that place his ministry start way back as early as, according to his own writing, as early as 1936. However, we've actually pushed it back even further. It appears he was working with leaders of white supremacy as early as, I think it was 1928 or 1929. We have him connected to Caleb Ridley, who is the imperial chaplain of the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> but that timeline is significant because... In 1936, Charles Price, who had this work of this writing of Jane Lead in her possession, he starts announcing that there's going to be a coming revival, and he's basing it off of this prophecy. If you read everything that he's saying and teaching about this, <clears throat> in fact, in the Pentecostal Evangel, Charles found the it's the uh, July 1939 issue. He even started a column in the Pentecostal Evangel called The Coming Revival. And all of this is based off of Jane Lead's prophecy. He's, he's claiming that there will be a manifestation of the sons of God. <clears throat> and this led to what, what exploded into the Latter Rain movement. But even further than that, as the manifested sons of God became a foundational teaching <clears throat> among the movement, it can be traced all the way back to Charles Price, who then we can also trace it all the way back to Jane Lead. Yeah, that's really good work, uh, John. Um, and uh, it seems like, where did I hear this? Um, could have been from Dr. Bridget uh, Jacobs. Uh, she's a real, real source of information about the latter rain, sons of God. Uh, she's a scholar. She's written about it extensively. Um, and it, interesting part about her is that she's ex nar so she comes from that angle and she um she also talked about uh, the charles price connection and um, there's one of the people that i refer to as the big four of the latter reign they're prophets who definitely were influenced by jane lead and said they were which is not always the case and sometimes it's secondary influence where the people probably don't even know where the information comes from. It's just they hear all the prophets talk about it, and so, yeah, let's get on the bandwagon and go with this move of God. Um, but um, the idea of, uh, of uh, Charles Price is mentioned by one of these uh, big four prophets of the latter reign as uh, being uh, found in the... Um, in the personal effects of Charles Price. And at that point, uh, the the sources that are so-called prophets don't really go further, of course. <laughs> they don't say anything that you just said, John. Uh, because as you know, it's, it's uh, very common for folks like this to say they got this revelation from God, uh, which means quite often they stole it from somebody else and thought it sounded great. And uh, they would take their own run with this information, these uh, prophecies and revelations. Um, but there's something that uh, I know your ears will really perk up to this, John, because you have such a wealth of information about Christian identity. Um, this segment, which we're doing, uh, uh, I'm thinking a good title for it would be Converging Apostasy from Jane Lee to Christian Identity, Part 1. And so how, how do I get into this is just a, a basic quick review is, is that Jane Lead introduced three potentially dangerous non-Christian themes to the church. And as I mentioned earlier, that is a moral perfection of some sort, uh, the right to dominion and the responsibility to carry out a physical, literal purge of the ungodly. All of this is very clearly stated, uh, not necessarily all of that in the 60 propositions, but in her other writings, yes, it's it's quite 
it's quite evident that it's there. And you can see how it's reflected in the people that, who plagiarized their works, even down to terminologies like the, uh, 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 the Melchizedek uh, priesthood, uh, the Feast Tabernacles, uh, all of these sorts of things, you, you hear them quite clearly through Jane Lead, and it's very obvious they were picked up in the latter reign. Um, okay, so leading on to um, how, do, how does Jane Lead have anything to do with Christian identity? Well, she said this. It's, it's a bit vague, but uh, kind of tilting in the same direction as the um, British uh, Israelism and uh, Christian identity were later to, to develop. She says, quote, this nation, meaning England, will be the source of light and knowledge to further increase and multiply for the opening of the fountains of such blessings with which the whole earth should be covered. There will descend flying angels who proclaim to this island and to all nations and tribes of the earth the glory and dominion of his Christed ones. Okay, so it's definitely connecting uh, the blessings uh, that are to fall on the whole earth and the uh, the kingdom of the manifest, uh, the manifest sons of God will bring in the kingdom, but it's connecting it to, um, you know, the England and all that that implies, uh, at least in her mind, racially speaking. So this was uh, uh, something that's very interesting is that the, the formation of what, what was called the Christian Identity Church, uh, a forerunner of, of uh, what what's developed nowadays and in the last 50 years or so. Uh, that was founded in 1883 by John Rowe. And lo and behold, he has in his writings, um, uh, people that he, he figures are pretty much uh, prophets and have uh, gone before his, his revelations. One of them being Richard Brothers, who I'm sure you know about John. And then other, uh, another person he claims to have been a great influence is uh, Jane Lead, and specifically he refers to uh, Lead's 60 propositions as being an influence on the Christian identity church. It's fascinating how all of this seems to come together, <clears throat> because I have been specifically interested to learn how the British Israel doctrine transitioned into the Christian identity, when it happened, all of the key players that were involved, and I mean, People like Ford was involved with this through the Dearborn Independent, right? Yeah. But I I spoke it was although it was correct, it was slightly off the mark. I had talked about how Gordon Lindsay, who was William Branham's campaign manager, he's the one started the voice well, he and Branham started the voice of healing together, but he ended up taking it, going on to Christ for the Nations. A lot of people were really shocked to learn that he was in British Israelism and spoke at conferences. Right. But it's it's deeper than that. <clears throat> There's another concept which plays off of what you just said. British Israelism itself was not a racist theology. Although it was a incorrect theology, they didn't take it to a racist position until much later after the movement had developed. I assumed mistakenly that that happened solely in the United States, but it appears there were two components to it. <clears throat> when it came into the United States and C.A.L. Totten was spreading British Israelism, remember the Klan was, um, the you know, the first version, iteration of the Klan had been, and then later in the, I think it was 1915, they were rebirthed, and there was a large white supremacy movement which influenced British Israelism, and that component went into Christian identity. But there was another uh, one from England called Anglo-Saxonism. Okay. And I, I'm still studying this because I want to fully understand and speak intelligently, so <laughs> I'll limit it to wow. what I know. But hmm. what, I, what I do know and what I can see is that when British Israelism merged with Anglo-Saxonism, it brought the racial component in, and the Anglo-Saxons were maybe not the supreme race, but they were a race that were the chosen ones, the elite, the, um, you know, in the, in the Lateran message cults, they would call it the elect, the elect seed yep. 
I think yep, is the phrase right. they used. <clears throat> so you have this elect seed doctrine coming in from England. Then on the American side, you had the white supremacy mixing with Christian identity. Well, the conferences that Gordon Lindsay attended were specifically the Anglo-Saxon Federation conferences. And as you probably already know, that was the conferences that Wesley Swift, who is one of the fathers of Christian identity, was influenced by and worked closely with. So at the point in time in which Gordon Lindsay, who is a key figure in latter rain, at the point of time in which he is working with British Israelism, he is already working with the Christian identity side of British Israelism, which explains uh, all of the the weirdness we find, like the UFO doctrines, many of yeah. the things that we've mentioned up to this point. Well, that the reason for that is the component that I was missing, the missing link that bind, bound it all together, was this, this um, Anglo-Saxonism doctrine. So the combination of this was... As far as theology, it was a deadly concoction of theology. No kidding, John. Uh, deadly is the right uh, right term there. So, yeah, uh, bringing it uh, closer to the uh, the latter reign. So we're moving from Jane Lee, that's uh, uh, 17th century, then John Rowe, of course, in the late 1800s. Uh, and that uh, connection with Richard uh, Brothers. Now, if, we, if I would uh, go ahead and join you, back at the latter rain, 1948. An uh, uh, interesting person that I, I can't remember really where I ran into him, uh, but his name was Eldon Purvis. And so Eldon Purvis, uh, I talked to him on the phone a few times, and I, <laughs> he was so vague, I would, I would try, to, try to, I guess, milk him out of some information about the end times and what he thought uh, was the, the right doctrinal position. And he would tell me very, very uh, cryptically, uh, there's going to be a great sifting, and the Lord is about to do a quick work. Okay, well, that's about as vague as you can get, but I couldn't, I couldn't get him to spit out anything other than that. But I did get a hold of his, um, his newsletter that he would send out, and it's, it's totally uh, got the connection between Lateran, Jane lead influenced manifest sons of God teachers and uh, straight up uh, racist uh, propaganda. And so and so um, how did how does that really occur? Well, you know, there's historical reasons where so and so showed up with so and so and when read the works of so and so and yada yada. Um, but there's a, there's also a theological precedent uh a uh, matter, uh, matter of fact, uh, I guess the word is exegesis, uh, ex, a way of a way of dealing with scripture and and uh, revelation. And that precedent is completely set by Jane Lead to take you anywhere you want to go. She said in numerous different ways, which I can count them uh, at another time, that revelation is ongoing. Um, that uh, it's not to be rested upon, as she says, as if there's nothing else to get from Scripture. She even goes as far, and, and that, that phrase uh, you can hear very clearly in Bill Britton in The Latter Rain, and also uh, similar comments from George Warnock is probably one of the biggest names from The Latter Rain, doctrinally speaking. But uh, yeah, Eldon, Eldon uh, followed up on that, that concept coming from Jane Lead. And you can see where it can take you. It can take you way, way outside of uh, normal rational thought and outside of uh, good sound Christian teaching. And so here's a, here's a reference to somebody who, who likewise sees this connection. I believe this uh, article is still available at Christian Research Institute. Um, and um, it's by Viola Larson. It's a, it's a, an article titled Christian Identity, A Christian Religion for White Racists, 2017. She makes a very, very uh, cogent point here. She says, because many identity adherents are people with a history of looking for, quote, new truths, obviously that you can get from ongoing revelation. She says, they often become, they often come to identity bringing some of the fringe teachings of the, quote, manifest sons of God, 
an elite group of the church who say they will bring in the kingdom. So that's, I thought that was just spot on what she had to say about that. And, and it really, it really jives with any of this stuff I've found out. Okay. So another thing about Eldon, uh, Mr. Purvis, he says, uh, well, he was with uh, new wine magazine and there, he was identified with the latter rain revival and the manifest sons of God teachings. Um, I think Eldon Purvis even has a little spot of infamy with the uh, Anti-Defamation League, if I'm not mistaken, as uh, being one of those kind of racist fellows you want to steer clear of. In the early 1970s, Eldon Purvis, made his, uh, his writings and others were made available through New Beginnings, um, uh, periodical that he sent out. And so he'd have lists of different uh, Manifest Sons of God and, and, and Identity works available. So here's an example, and boy, this is the, the antithesis of the cream of the cream. Uh, he had available, I saw this at, at his uh, newsletter, he had available David Hogan's uh, The Myth of the Six Million. He had The Sword of Truth, by the Manifest Sons of God-based Christian identity preacher Wesley Swift. He had made available Dan Gaiman's The Two Seeds of Genesis 3.15, uh, Jack Moore's Satan's Kids, fa uh, facts about that every Christian should know about, and the International Jewish Conspiracy, uh, which is aimed at controlling you and the world. He had also available William Grimstad's the six million reconsidered is a quote Nazi Holocaust unquote a story uh, made up by uh, a Zionist propagandist, and he also had this was interesting to me. He also had uh, available books uh, by pre you know what is manifest sons of God based and it comes from uh, the latter rain, um, but uh, folks that refer to themselves as present truth teachers. So those are the ones that they, you know, they cut their teeth on the latter rain teachings, manifest sons of God doctrines, but through ongoing revelation, therefore present truth, uh, they see this as like snowballing, adding to and developing, which is right up the alley of uh, Jane Leeds' way of approaching truth and scripture. So to get to what I was about to say, um, Kelly Varner some of his books were available. Now, Kelly Varner goes forwards and backwards in this whole timeline. He was a buddy of, of uh, Bill Britton's, a bit younger. So when Bill Britton passed away, uh, Varner kept on going with his teachings. Um, and then moving forward, Kelly Varner uh, would show up and speak at uh, conferences uh, with Bill Britt, uh, excuse me, Bill Hammond the prophet of the uh, Dinar. And he would also, uh, ha he had connections with uh, Earl Polk of the so-called Dominion Dominionist uh, Kingdom message in the 1980s. So he's, he's a really interesting fellow. He's the one I called up and asked him, uh, will the sons of God have the, uh, the responsibility of literally, literally taking out uh, the ungodly? And he kind of hemmed and hawed for a little bit and said, uh, well, brother, uh, you know, they uh, uh, they will reap what they sow. Uh, nobody has to kill them. They kill themselves. And then he said, uh, uh, <laughs> and then I pressed him. I said, well, does that mean anything else in your mind? He said, and then he started quoting some scriptures from uh, Ezekiel uh, 7, 8, and 9 which talk about things like go through the, uh, go through the temple, uh, have not mercy, slaughter the, uh, the young, the old, the, the children, the women. I say, oh, okay, I've heard that one before. It came straight from the mouth of Bill Britton. And Bill Britton, another one who plagiarized and was influenced by Jane Lee. So yeah, that kind of concept comes around. Who else? Uh, ran into the writings of David Ebal, and we'll we'll talk it was a little stop with him uh, later uh, in this conversation, uh, but we've already talked about him a bit. But yeah, so Ebal talked to him on the phone a few times. Uh, he almost comes across like a spiritist, uh, but he's definitely a Jane Lead influence, and he he mentions he got a lot of his ideas from Bill Britton, 
and so he was influenced by him. Uh, Spiritus, in the way of, uh, like all of these fellows, when they head that direction through ongoing revelation, what they do is they appropriate um, kind of, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, a different version of what uh, what uh, the book of Hebrews talks about, the great cloud of witnesses. Uh, you might have just called that uh, angels that we're going to contact and chan- channel and and uh, and the Valentinius version of all this is that they will, uh, through union with these angels, uh, perfection and sinlessness will occur. Uh, Ebal, Britain, all these fellows, they walk in the shadow of Jane Lee because she's very explicit about those sorts of things, which she got from the esoteric world. And so just to wrap up that little uh, thought, uh, again, the Anti-Defamation League, which, of course, is looking out uh, for the rights of everybody and uh, essentially, uh, well, especially for, for Jewish folks, uh, they have Swift, Gaiman, Moore, and Grimstad uh, listed as dangerous racists uh, who have either inspired or participated in hate crimes, including murder. And so... Uh, yeah, interesting that Eldon Purvis is kind of uh, leaning this way and leaning it that way, meaning the Sons of God stuff influenced by Jane Lead. On the other hand, uh, just pure, uh, unadulterated, uh, racist thought. <laughs> I was struggling a bit not to laugh while you're talking uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> for different reasons than you think. <clears throat> okay. We have two camps of listeners to this podcast. On the one side, we have people who have been in churches that are based on sound Christian theology, and they're hearing all of this that you're saying, and they're thinking, this sounds like a lot of hocus pocus. (laughs) This (laughs) This is mysticism, plain and simple. How could anybody who's claiming to be Christian believe this stuff, right? Yep. Yep. Then we have the other camp. There's a large number of people who are now following the website and the YouTube and the podcast, and <clears throat> they were raised in this thing. So when you uh, mention key phrases like the present truth, right. many of them would actually say, well, no, wait a minute, brother, that's biblical, <laughs> because yeah. they've been raised like that, right? <clears throat> mm-hmm. And the way it's probably good if we pause and just try to try to establish a bit of boundaries separating these two camps of people, because as we go forward in this podcast, it's going to make a lot more sense to the people who are listening from both sides <laughs> so that they can understand each other better. <clears throat> there is this notion called present truth, and every group, every sect that I've worked with or studied, they have their own phraseology for it. In In the Branhamite cults, they would call it the... <clears throat> what would they call it, progressive revelation. In other mm, words, yeah. it's unclear now, it becomes more clear, and they, they'll they quote Bible verses, actual Bible verses, to support that theory. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> what it really is, it is mysticism, plain and simple, if you go back and you study the foundations of this thing. But think of it, if you're in the camp who was never raised in this thing and you're, you're wondering what in, what in the world is this picture yeah. it like a crystal ball and picture these guys who are doing this like like Dowie. He advertised mm. himself in the newspaper articles, John Alexander Dowie, as a Christian mystic. And what he would do is he would make claims like this it's it's not fully clear to us now what this really vague prophecy that i just gave you is but as time goes on and oh by the way i'm revising that prophecy and polishing it up as new facts come in i can have this broad scope of prophecy and as i get more information to make it more relevant i can now narrow it down over time as as new information comes to me and because he set that precedent, ministers who were, again, they're taking British Israel theology, they're taking passages from the Old Testament and trying to apply it to the church of that era, which doesn't fit at all. They would also say that it's, it's progressive. It's very vague. It's like the crystal ball. It's really smoky. I can't see it. Right. And what they did was they used to their advantage the fact that the, the prophecies of the Old Testament were symbolic, and so if you read them just for their symbolism, it does sound vague. 
But the difference yeah. between what they have and what the Bible has, as time progresses in these types of movement with the present truth, the progressive revelation, what they're actually doing is revising what they said to make it fit. Yep. In other words, they're scamming the people. Whereas the yep. biblical prophecy, it was symbolic until the event happened. And when the event happened, it was so perfectly clear that, oh, that's exactly what they were talking about because those are the symbols. We can see it right here today. And they didn't have to go through a process of revising and having quote unquote present truth or progressive revelation. So if you're in one camp or the other to understand each other better, if you're in the camp who is never with this, they've been taught that you can revise a prophecy over time. William Branham did it. He even openly admitted he revised his 1933 prophecies that made him famous. These yeah. guys are revising mm. prophecies to make it present truth. So if you're in that camp, that's why they do it. If you're in the other camp, realize that Christianity is not like a crystal ball. <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get clear as you take your rag and you wipe the crystal ball. That's, that's mysticism, plain and simple. Yeah, John, that, uh, that's uh, bringing a lot of thoughts to my mind. Uh, I was jotting down as you were speaking uh, people who who really sounded like they were clearly stating um, the idea that uh, yeah we're we're mystics <laughs> okay so one is uh, George Houghton who I mentioned I talked to several times and he wrote letters to me and I uh, read a lot of his works uh, so George Houghton and I forgot which one it was, but he said something to, he misspells mystic, but he says, isn't it a wonderful thing to be, in, uh, be uh, initiated into the, the, uh, the, mystery, the, the mysteries of God, something to that effect? I said, yeah, well, you know, that's like, uh, you, you know, you might as well be in, in the so-called New Age movement if you talk like that. Um, and, and the whole point of uh, convergence uh, as I see it, between uh, non-Christian uh, movements that are spouting out similar ideas, the th the the modus of operandi that will get you into that that realm of teaching uh, from a Christian beginning point is if you can buy into the idea of some form of, as we're talking about, present truth, ongoing revelation, and uh, there's many ways. Um, that uh, you're speaking of people in, in those two camps, uh, folks that listen to this. Well, if you're in, say, the NAR movement, and you've already bought into the idea that there are present-day prophets and apostles uh, carrying all the weight of authority and revelatory skills that they can muster, then you're sort of a sitting duck. You know, they can take you wherever they want you to go. What I have found uh, that rather than these revelations coming from God, which I do not believe uh, as zero percent that that's happening, um, there's already sort of uh, uh, like uh, little lines, strings of attachment, little paths that you can take where if, if you bought into the idea of ongoing revelation, well, there's just one step further from the uh, the NAR ideas that you can take that leap. There's another step. And uh, one, of, one of the metaphors I always think of is sort of like a rotten onion. And so, the uh, you know, on the outside, when you peel it back, they're saying things like, uh, uh, you know, like a generalized, uh, let's make this nation better for God, let's take back the nation, et cetera. Uh, and then you peel back another layer, and it goes to, well, the way to do that is to... Uh, to be in a church where you're under the authority of one of the present-day apostles and prophets. And, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, you look in Ephesians, it says that uh, these these ministries are for the perfecting of the saints. And so once somebody's bought into that, then it's not far to go to some, uh, some writings that are influenced or directly associated with the manifest sons of God and William Branham and Jane Lead kind of, lurking in the background there. So, for example, here's here's uh, another fellow. I've already mentioned him quite a bit, Bill Brenton. So I talked to, he had already passed away or was, no, I think uh, the same year that I contacted his ministry, he was extremely busy and moving about and doing uh, prophetic conferences and his writings. 
So I ended up talking. I couldn't get, get a hold of him, but I got a hold of two of his, uh, his underlings, associate pastors. One was Roy Ralph, and uh, the other was David Tice. Both of them completely confirmed what I, what I was talking about. His daughter, of, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, Becky uh, Britton, uh, she has verified that, yes, uh, her dad used the writings of, uh, of Jane Lee, and he was way into that. He was way into Christian uh, numerology, and he was even into uh, selected portions of Kabbalah, which is straight up uh, esoteric thought. So I, I recently emailed to Becky, who's very open about this kind of stuff, like, you know, she respects her dad, loved her dad, as anybody would. Um, but she also just, without making any kind of uh, definitive drawing the line, she says, okay, yeah, here's his stuff. You can you can make your own decision about whether you think it's of God or not. So she sent me a, a, a taped uh, sermon uh, on a CD. It's, it's entitled, Jesus Was Not a Jew. So on the surface, you can say, oh, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of open-ended. Uh, but how does he fill in the gaps? And that's where he makes what I refer to as an open-door doctrine. Jesus was not a Jew. Boy, it's like, that's, you can unpack that in numerous ways. Well, here's what he says. He says, Israel is not a holy nation. They are a generation of vipers. Ooh, now we're getting a little bit uh, deep here. And then he says, the corporate body of Christ are the spiritual Jews who will multiply and rule the earth. Okay, now again, you have something sort of, un, it's sort of vague, and you have to unpack it, and you have to uh, bring it to where you want it to go, but if there's already a doctrinal uh, connection between that sort of vague teaching and the deeper revelations, and the deeper revelations hap happen to be provided by folks who've got one foot in the latter rain, the manifest sons of God, and one foot in Christian identity, then it's a way to pull people up if, or out or down into that deeper, uh, more problematic perspective. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, somebody who totally respected Bill Britton and references him a couple of times in his writings, that's David Ebal. I talked to him. He was, he was actually one of the least uh, earthy, kind of uh, somewhat uneducated fellow that, that some of, unfortunately, some of the people, uh, uh, you, if you weren't, if you weren't um, more Janish, you might say, oh, well, they just don't know what they're talking about. They're not uh, trained doctrinally, and that's why they're coming up with this wacky stuff. David Ebal was a pretty educated man. I think, he, I forgot which, he was an engineer. I forgot which kind of engineering he did, but he, you can tell when you listen to his, his tapes, uh, he's got a lot up his sleeve, but he's pretty subtle the way he does it. Okay, so he had messages uh, listed. Uh, uh, one of them says the evil usury system. Okay, that's a definite, definite uh, dog whistle or a dog megaphone, whatever you want to call it. He has another uh, message called the seed of Satan. He has one called spiritual Israel. Now, there is a tie because you can hear anybody like from Narfolk uh, through back on through the sons of God, teachers of the latter rain. Um, this idea that, the, you know, we are the spiritual Israel, then who's these other guys? Well, that's an open door into um, denigrating them. And so sure enough, a lot of folks do. He also has, uh, I know you know all about this, uh, John. He has a teaching on pyramid in the Bible. <laughs> I know William Branham had a lot to say about that. He even took it to his grave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I had to say that, but I know what you, <laughs> I know what you would think. Uh, okay, then he had a, uh, Ebal has another teaching called uh, the missing tribes. I get it, and another one called international banking. He says, now this is interesting and a bit subtle. But he's kind of he's kind of going wink wink hint hint. He says that quote the erroneous idea of a burning earth comes from Second Peter th three, ten through twelve. 
But instead, he says that this burning exclusively refers to the laws of Moses. Hmm, I wonder if anything's connected to the laws of Moses. Uh, was that the Jews who received the laws of Moses? And what's this word burning? I, I'm sure you've heard that uh, word used in, in very wicked, um, insinuating ways from folks like Wesley Swift. Yeah, there's so many concepts that <clears throat> I, I recently read the, uh, I don't even, I'm scared to call this a book, but I, I recently read The Learned Elders of Zion, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, which was, right. this is what sparked what is called the Jewish conspiracy. And when you read it and you understand how that book, how that ideology was weaponized by Christian identity, and then you understand the biblical references that they used in order to weaponize it, suddenly all of this starts to make sense. For, for example, you talked about how <clears throat> Jesus was not a Jew as one of the common theologies. In the Latter Rain movement, the Jews were not to be saved by the gospel. In fact, Branham, the leader of the Latter Rain movement, said specifically the gospel is not to the Jews. And he makes some weird statement like only the renegades might accept the gospel, whereas mm. the biblical Paul said the gospel was first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, right? Right. But you have to understand what they're – the way that they have overloaded that phrase, they see the biblical – version of the Jew as being the pure race, the pure seed, the pure bloodline. Mm. And they see mm -hmm. the Jews that we see today as the Jewish conspiracy. And so therefore, they don't see Jesus as being part of this. And he has to be separate from it. So you will find in the latter rain movement there, there's actually theology I grew up with, stating that Mary was just um, Mary, the mother of Jesus was just an incubator. And uh. Joseph was had no part obviously because it was um you know divine divinely produced jesus into the the womb of mary but they separate the human aspect of jesus so that jesus could not be human in this movement because if he is human then he has part of mary's bloodline and if he has part of mary's bloodline he's a jew and he's part of the evil seed uh -huh. i did not know this was racist but i grew up believing this weird thing right and right. I never will forget the first real church that I went to that actually had some theology. I, I was trying to wrap my head around that concept, and I explained what I, what I believed, and they like, what in the world? <laughs> and they started referencing all these passages talking about how he was fully God, fully man. How can you be this right. if you're not part of Mary's bloodline, right? But mm. it's it's all part of the Christian identity movement, and they – they twist the Bible phrases to fit the Christian identity motives, and those motives were based off of these, you know, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion was a propaganda spreading. I, it is called a book, but it was a propaganda publishing in order to target the Jews and to spread anti-Semitism, basically, was the purpose of this book. That's correct, John. And if I jump in at that point, uh, yeah, I was scribbling down things when you you talked about the the blood, um, and also the thing that uh, uh, I think uh, theologians would say uh, that Branham uh, at all uh, really violate what the, what would be called the the hypostasis of Christ, fully man, fully God, from birth till death, uh, never had that altered. Every false prophet, false, false teacher that we've ever run into tinkers with and destroys um, uh, what I would think of as a biblical understanding of the hypostasis, as you were just outlining. Um, so the part about the blood, um, oh, and, and I've never mentioned this before, but my dad was a, um, a very good, uh, faithful uh, pastor, uh, Presbyterian, and uh he he uh, introduced me to some of the uh, the early councils uh, of the church and some of the so-called like the church fathers, very early leaders in Christianity, and they had to deal with this stuff all the way back then, uh, separating the man Jesus from the Christ who overshadowed him, whoever who uh, empowered him, 
from his baptism. Um, and so, yeah, big, big mis misunderstanding. And the, and the unfortunate part that you will hear, people who say that, uh, a very high percentage of them also say that this opens the door for us, say, in a Mormon-esque kind of way, to also become what he was. And a real uh, big, th you know, uh, Light of Rain Manifest Sons of God, the uh, uh, Feast of Tabernacles uh, by George Warner is a big thing. Another one is Bill Britton's Jesus, the Pattern Son. Get it? The Pattern Son. Uh, so he's teaching you. Uh, he's opened the way for you to become as he is, quite literally. Um, okay, so other folks from the Light of Rain who are absolutely influenced by Jane Lead and said so, you got Royal Cronquist, uh, George Houghton, the original apostle, founder, so-called, of the latter Rain movement as it occurred in Saskatchewan. Then you got J. Preston Eby. Uh, so here's what Cronquist has to say. Again, he says the word Israel refers exclusively to the sons of God. He says there's much in Scripture, though he doesn't say what it is, that speaks about pre-Adamic races of men. You can actually even hear that from uh, Helen Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society. Uh, she clearly states she's a Satanist and in her writings and gives all kinds of references to make that very plain. Uh, but yeah, there's this pre-Adamic race, and then there's uh, the pure uh, other race, so Cronquist follows up with that, and he says, the blood, as you were talking about, the blood of my body was different from that of the fallen race of the first Adam. Okay. Then Mr. Houghton, the prophet, apostle, whatever he was, uh, he says also the blood that flowed in his veins was the lifeblood of God. Ooh, that sounds like it's honoring Jesus and God. But look at what it also implies on the other side. If he had the lifeblood, this pure Aryan uh, blood, then what, what does that signify about all those other folks that don't have it, specifically the Jews? Uh, Houghton would send me, I think I mentioned this before, uh, the living creature origin of the, of the Negro, stating that uh, black people were subhuman beasts of the field made for servitude to white folks. He also had in his writings uh, this this uh, interesting idea. He said, um, "Oh, and you, you mentioned uh, the part about uh, British British Israelism not being quite so uh, um, virulent, if that's the right word, uh, version of tinkering with uh, the lost tribes." Uh, I saw something, a good analysis of Houghton's teachings that say he was one of those who. Uh, was sort of a forerunner in a way to take the leap from the British Israelism uh, leading on to uh, more strictly racist ideas of uh, Christian identity. So uh, he said that all forms of intermarriage with other races are strictly forbidden. That kind of uh, brings to my mind things in the Third Reich forbidden, uh, you know, uh, for the Jews. He also says that Christian... Uh, Christians should, no Christian, excuse me, should ever consent to such a union or accept the mongrel children that it produces. That's pretty dark stuff. Then he says, any thinking person knows that the Saxon nations are the recipients of all the blessings of heaven and earth. Kind of has a Jane Lead ring to it, and it kind of um, sounds a little bit on the way towards Mr. Swift. Then uh, Houghton says, Henry Ford's remarkable words, and he quotes him, the fathers of our nation were men of the Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, or Celtic race. And he quotes uh, William Law. He says, the carnal Jew crucified their dear Redeemer and Savior because their only desire was for su the success of Judaism. Uh, just a quick uh, tag on to that. Uh, it's funny how these guys kind of pick up the same ideas, and they, like I said, they, they claim they got it from God. Don't think so. E.B. says, the notable, <laughs> he's, you know, he's, he's verbatim of what Houghton uh, says. The notable English mystic William Law 
wrote about the carnal Jew who crucified their savior. Then later in the same book or tract or whatever it was, uh, J. Preston E.B. says, um, he, he quotes B, uh, Howard B. Rand, who's the author of the white sem- supremacist text, uh, Primogenesis. Right, and Howard Rand was the founder of the Anglo-Saxon Federation, the one I mentioned earlier that Gordon Lindsay was a part of. Um, so this, all of it connects together. I think people don't realize how deeply rooted the white supremacy version of Christian identity uh, British Israelism <clears throat> was in the Laterene movement. We're talking about the founders of Laterene were teaching this theology. And to the camp who <laughs> who's looking at all of this thinking, this is really weird. What are they talking about? Mm. I was I was 37 years old believing this while also manipulated to believe that that ideology was not racist. I was taught that if you were a Christian, you didn't marry outside of your race. And if you did, their offspring could not enter the, to the kingdom of heaven. That was one of our foundational teachings, right? And it was a divine right. mystery from God. So <clears throat> if you're in the camp that's never been part of this, then understand that that's how they're taught. And also understand that, <clears throat> like myself, I would not have considered myself racist. I know now that it was, and I've deeply apologize for being this way, but I had no idea. That's how we were taught and manipulated. If you're on the camp who is in it, (laughs) realize that not only is it racist, this came directly from white supremacy leaders. It was no divine revelation, and you can trace it back to the early 1800s. I don't care which prophet you follow that teaches this. You can trace its roots all the way back to this, and then if you really take it back to Jane Lead, we're going, you know, decades, centuries before that. So this was a racist ideology. It was a racist movement. <clears throat> but where it gets really weird, and we'll we'll get into this further as we go, Steve, it's racism and white supremacy and Anglo-Saxonism, but it's mixed with mysticism and that and politics. You've got this combination of four different things coming into this. There are other things too, but these are four main components. When all of this blends together, this is what actually gives roots that the NAR can grow from. I hear you, John. Yeah, you, you're hitting it on the head. I'm glad you talked about the NAR, NAR in that last uh, uh, statement you said, because uh, rolling through my mind um, is uh, that Gwen Shaw, who was accepted as one of the uh, prophet, prophets of, of the NAR, and uh, associated uh, with uh, Cindy Jacobs and, and Bill Hammond and all the others who are just one step away from um, connections, uh, you could say high connections in, in, Cap- in, the, in Washington, uh, very politically active and promoters of, uh, of uh, the kind of people they think uh, would adhere to their same ideas. Uh, yeah, so uh, Gwen Shaw, part of the NAR uh, said kind of the same stuff. A uh, couple of quick comments here. There's a couple of cults other than the ones that we've mentioned. Uh, one was uh, Buddy, Co- Buddy Cobb uh, was a right-hand man of Sam Five, who was the leader of the cult known as the Move. And uh, Fife was another very close associate with the Jane Lead inspired Bill Britton. Uh, so let's see, what does uh, Cobb have to say? He says, Old Testament Israel, the Jews, are not the chosen people. They are the rejected people. Okay, so there, there again, it's like an open door into those other uh, kinds of ideas. Moses David Berg, uh, as we've said before, was a leader of the cult uh, known as the Children of God. It's got like several other aliases that were used. And, and again, another one influenced by the latter rain. He, in particular used, as you said, uh, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Uh, Yeah, one of the horrible uh, pieces of propaganda that's been misused and the, you know, complicit in the the murder of uh, millions of of Jews. Um, He said, our true importance as the bride of Christ uh, is that we are the one and only Israel of God. And he also said that the curse of Ham is to be applied to black people. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's also 
reflected in the esoteric writings of Helena Blavatsky, as I mentioned earlier. Then one of the more interesting um, folks uh, that I've run into fairly recently, uh, who are, they say that they're, um, they're uh, present true teachers, and uh, that's Terry and Tyke Crisp of Good Seed Publications. Uh, they claim that they are influenced by George Houghton, Bill Britton, William Branham. And so here's, here's a little nugget that they threw out in their writings. Um, some, suggest, sorry, some suggest the possibility of a pre-Adamic race of men, and they don't put any kind of negative connotation. They say, yeah, you know, some of us have received that revelation, so it's, it's got to be good. The only other thing I could say about uh, the CRISP is they are a prime example of folks that, that are totally based in latter rain, manifest sons of God teachings, but have uh, begun to have ideas of convergence with their concepts and with straight ahead um, uh, new age teachings, especially the ones that are um, influenced by uh, the Luciferian, and she claims that she is, uh, Alice Bailey, uh, in the uh, um, 1920s on to about 1950, she was writing these things. Well, Steve, let's do this. We are only skimming the surface of Jane Lead to Christian identity, and this yeah. is something that I truly want to explore more. I think it would sh it's already going to shock people that there is this weird connection between the two. I highly recommend, if you're listening and you want to know more about the Christian identity side of things, read the book Religion and the Racist Right, the Origins of the Christian Identity Movement by Michael Barkun. That book, for me, was mind-boggling because <laughs> suddenly I learned the history of where I came from, but it's from a non-theological level. It's going tracing the roots all the way back to white supremacy and mm. British Israelism. What we're talking about doesn't contradict that. It supplements that because— right. If you take the Gnosticism that flowed through all of this, Gnosticism was the foundation that Barkun's work could be literally built upon. So <clears throat> let's cut it off here, Steve. Let's come back next mm. week, and um, let's pick up where we left off. The shorter uh, book that I have available now is uh, also available on Amazon. It's called A Quick Outline of Hands-On Eschatology, A Matter of Timing and Agency. Uh, it's uh, less expensive and only about uh, 60 pages full of quote after quote after quote uh, dealing with perfectionism, dominionism, rulership, and uh, what I refer to as the sacred purge. If you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org. For an overview about the dark side of the latter rain, Read Weaponized Religion from Latter Rain to Colonia Dignidad, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. And for more about the converging apostasy, read The Converging Apostasy, a collection of thematic critiques, available on Amazon and Kindle. 